right. Well, it is 7 p.m. sharp, so I think we uh, can go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, so as mentioned, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Janine Higgins. I'm an engagement and education specialist with Alberta Environment and Parks, um, and I'll be the facilitator for our session this evening. So to start off, I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging uh, that I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of Treaty 6, but would also like to recognize that we've come together this evening to speak um, about Lesser Slave Lake, which of course is on the traditional territory of Treaty 8. So I'd like to acknowledge that we are coming together online from traditional territories and homelands of many Indigenous peoples. And I would like to acknowledge the treaties in this province as all of Alberta is treaty land and we are all treaty people. I acknowledge the long history and deep connections that First Nations and Métis people have with this land. And I honor this today in hopes of working together in a good way. So for this evening, uh, we're going to go through a bit of a welcome, uh, just introducing you to the session this evening, what we, what we are, are hoping to accomplish um, and how we're going to go about doing that. So some of the technical aspects on Zoom this evening. And then I'm going to pass it over to Miles, who is going to be our lead presenter for this, this evening, is going to talk all about Lesser Slave Lake uh, before we move into our question and answer and then close the meeting at 8.30 tonight. So in terms of some of the technical aspects for Zoom, if you've been on a webinar with um, Alberta Environment and Parks, you'll probably be familiar with this, but we are going to be using our question and answer tool. So depending on if you're joining from a phone or uh, from a desktop computer, you should have a black bar either at the bottom of your screen or at the top um, where Q&A is an option. So if you click on that and open it up, you'll be able to type in your questions there. And um, what we will be doing for this evening, one of the ways to sort the questions is using upvoting. So if you see a question that somebody asks throughout the presentation that you'd really like to hear an answer to, um, you can go ahead and click that upvote button and that will help us to be able to sort through the questions um, in terms of how we're answering them. So um, for all of the questions that we have coming in for this evening, um, of course, if there's any inappropriate questions, we're just going to be deleting those. So keep it clean, folks. I'm sure that won't be a problem for us tonight. Um, but if we find that we're having a lot of questions that are very similar in nature, we're going to try and group them together. And um, if we're getting the same questions over and over again um, on the same topic, we may just dismiss them. So again, really trying to cover as much tonight as we can about Lesser Slave Lake um, and the fishery there. And we're also going to be answering some of the questions that were pre-submitted as well. And so um, we asked when you registered for this webinar, if there were questions that you'd like to hear the answers to, and hopefully Miles is gonna answer a lot of those in his presentation tonight, um, but we'll, we'll start off our Q&A with a couple of those pre-submitted questions as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. So as mentioned, uh, Miles Brown is going to be our lead presenter for this evening, and he's the senior fisheries biologist for the region. Um, and we also have Christy Wakeling here, who is one of the area biologists, Kate on Wilcox, who's our fisheries manager for the Northwest. And we have Ryan Green here um, from Justice and Solicitor General. So Ryan is actually joining us from the field um, tonight, so he doesn't have his video on, um, but he is here and he will be actively participating on our panel. So from our side of things, as I mentioned, I'm going to be facilitating for this evening. And I've also got my coworker here, Alyssa, who's going to be supporting with some of our, our technical aspects of, of the evening and making sure everything runs smoothly. So when we move into the Q&A, um, she'll actually have her video off. So she'll still be here sort of working in the background and making sure everything is working well for us, um, but not necessarily somebody who you'll be directly interacting with. So with that, I would like to pass it off to Miles, who is going to be taking us through our presentation. Uh, thanks very much, Janine. And uh, thank you very much, everybody who's had the opportunity to join us here this evening. Uh, really look forward to the chance to uh, present some information, answer some questions, and have a good dialogue about Lesser Slave Lake and some of the rivers that feed Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, certainly a system I think that's probably near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, so uh, why are we here this evening? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take some time and summarize some of the past management actions and regulations that have been implemented on Lesser Slave Lake 
uh, that have affected the recreational fishery, indigenous, commercial tournament fishing. Uh, I'm going to share some information about the fish stocks in the lake, the fishery itself, um, provide some links and point people to different resources that are online that speak about our fisheries management system, our regulation books, and where we can find stuff specifically about Lesser Slave Lake. Of note, commonly when we've had the opportunity to engage with the public, uh, a lot of times uh, uh, examples would be last year's uh, webinars and, and in some years in the past, uh, we're talking about regulations and options. Uh, that is the next step in this process. So tonight isn't going to be a conversation about uh, what reg we would look at to put on for a species on Lesser Slave Lake or anything. Uh, this is really more that you know recognition that there's been a time gap between uh, when the last conversation happened and regulations were set for Lesser Slave and now, and in that time, we've seen lots of change, lots of development, lots of growth. Uh, there's been uh, a bunch of different projects and assessments on the fishery, and we want to present that information so that as we as we get to that stage later on at a provincial level, uh, that there is there is a better understanding of uh, what's been going on in Lesser Slave Lake, uh, and help people kind of decide what they would like to see for the future. Uh, so the way the talk is going to be structured here is I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about roles and responsibilities uh, as a fisheries biologist in Alberta Environment and Parks uh, and what some of our partner agencies at the provincial and federal level do. I'm going to talk about our fisheries management system very briefly. A lot of our resources for our fish management system are available online. Uh, I'll try to point those out as we're going through. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to talk specifically about Lesser Slave Lake, sort of the meat and potatoes of why we're here uh, and the status of the fish stocks and the fishery in the lake itself. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the sustainability threats. So those things that uh, we face as managers and that uh, any fisher uh, recognizes exists that, that are out there that uh, have to be grappled with in order to deliver a sustainable fishery. Um, we're going to end with some key points, uh, things for people to take home and ponder about Lesser Slave Lake. And after that, get into a, a good discussion and hopefully answer some questions. Uh, so roles and responsibilities. Um, as a fisheries biologist for Alberta Environment Parks, uh, we have a fairly complex job, but a lot of it really boils down to simplistic uh, kind of themes. How many fish are in a lake? Uh, what are the threats that those fish face? How many fish are harvested and by whom? Uh, and it comes around to, to one of our key functions, which is basically uh, allocating fish, understanding what's in the bank account, how we can spend it, and what the goals and objectives for that, uh, that are. Uh, we work with a whole bunch of different partners uh, to ensure fisheries sustainability, growth, and management. Uh, our colleagues in federal fisheries and oceans uh, have different mandates. They would look at things like uh, habitat regulation and management. Uh, they deal with different regulatory processes. If people are looking to uh, put in a marina or do different developments, they would engage at the provincial and federal level. Um, our colleagues also have a very strong role in terms of planning and administration for species at risk when, when fish species have really gotten to that point where they are a conservation threat, uh, and we have to focus very, very adamantly on their recovery. Um, at the provincial level, we work with other colleagues as well. So our, our colleagues in Alberta Health uh, do testing for things like mercury. They produced a great website called Can I Eat This Fish uh, that helps people understand what some of the risks might be around consuming fish uh, from different water bodies of different species of different sizes. Uh, we have peers in the Alberta Energy Regulator that look at um, the consequences and, and help to manage fish habitat and fisheries objectives uh, particular to uh, that industrial activity. Uh, we have peers in the lands and forestry division who um, handle those processes and, and liaise with us to ensure that uh, fisheries values are represented in those different activities. Uh, and at the same time, we can provide insights into that to, to ensure that both the company partners and uh, government are, are able to incorporate fish conversations into land use activities. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Policy for Alberta uh, kind of lays out that, that allocation approach that I just mentioned. And, and for some folks here, they'll probably have seen this a few times in the, in the past. Uh, if not, um, the way we go about allocating fish in the province is, as our first objective, is essentially the maintenance of biodiversity. So we ensure that we, we want self-sustaining wherever possible and, and naturally uh, allowable. We want fish to continue to produce more fish, to have healthy fisheries, and when we have a harvestable surplus of those fish, that's when we can start talking about fisheries, uh, the use of those fish. Uh, our first responsibility there is to honor indigenous fishing rights, ensuring that uh, subsistence and cultural harvest of fish is, uh, is allowed in these fisheries and, and those fishers are, are able to engage in a, in a way that, that um, 
is appropriate for them. Uh, beyond that is the recreational fishery, obviously very important uh, to Albertans. Uh, this allows us to sustain fishing and provide fisheries of a whole bunch of different opportunities across the province. Uh, and then beyond that, we have different commercial purposes, things like uh, guide uh, outfitting, which is very popular in certain rivers and lakes in the province, uh, tournament fishing, different special uh, fishing events, uh, all of which take place looking to utilize the same resource uh, across the province. So uh, there is a diverse uh, group looking to utilize these fish, uh, and we have to take all of those uses into consideration. And so how would we do that? Well, uh, that starts with, with having good information. Uh, so we need to understand our fish communities, how many fish are there, what species, what their status is, what their, their structure and abundance is. Um, in order to do that, we use standardized methodology. We wanna make sure that how we're sampling fisheries is defensible, robust, repeatable, uh, comparable within the province across a broad spatial range, comparable to our neighbors in other provinces and states. Uh, and we want to utilize information from people in the public. We talk with fishers, we, we talk with other industrial partners, we take observations and feedback how people are experiencing a fishery at the end of the fishing rod, and we plug that back into this system. So what does that system actually look like? Fisheries management is a cycle. Um, you can, if you look at the, the diagram that's on the screen here, this comes from our Fish and Wildlife Conservation and Management Strategy. Um, Really, you can pick any place on this cycle to begin. It happens all the time. Uh, if we think of it in terms of how a calendar year might roll out, commonly we would start with assessments. So spring, summer, fall, uh, we would look at how fish are doing. This helps us answer one of those key questions. Uh, how many fish? What does the population look like? From there, we're able to assign a, a sustainability status to that. Is this a high, medium, or low risk to sustainability? Uh, from there, we can take those results and package them in summaries and reports bring that to the public, engage, present that information, get some feedback, and ultimately what we're driving towards is setting management objectives, fisheries management objectives. Fish management objectives and regulations are linked, and the regulations, the guide, that's how we most commonly interact with our fisheries. It's what we see uh, when we're going out to actually have a day on the water where we understand how many fish we could take of what size. Uh, and this iterative process just continues on and on through time. Uh, when you think about the concept of a fish management objective, the way that we've interpreted this in Alberta and broke it down is we feel like it roughly has kind of four pieces. There's an indigenous fisheries management objective, recreational, ecosystem, and habitat. And while each one of these things requires maybe different regulatory approaches or rules, we understand that they're all intrinsically linked as it's, it's the same fish stock and fish population, whether that's in a lake or a river, uh, that we're looking to utilize. So the management means we got to pay attention to all those different uh, components ultimately driving towards a common goal or end. In the case of recreational fishing objectives, the, the red box you see in the bottom of the figure there, uh, we have a default. And in any of our recreation management frameworks, whether for walleye or pike, what we have stated is that the default objective for those species is sustainable harvest. Uh, so it's sort of that balance between uh, moderate risk, having a moderate abundance, uh, reasonable size class structure, and ensuring the opportunity to harvest is there if people want to take it. So what other fisheries might exist? So if we're in the realm of these recreational fisheries management objectives, uh, they can be applied at a species level and a water body level. So that could be for walleye in Lesser Slave Lake, that could be for walleye in the Lesser Slave Lake drainage, uh, depending on, on how we're trying to manage. Uh, it could be the default objective for a fish management zone, NB2. Uh, so these things can apply it at different levels. And if you open our frameworks, which again are available uh, on our website at either alberta.ca fisheries management or on uh, My Wild Alberta, these objectives have names and, and um, these names just try to capture essentially what an experience would be for each of those fisheries, a sustainable harvest objective. Uh, again, we're ensuring that that harvest is sort of the key function and the trade-off that might come with that is slightly lower catch rates. Uh, maybe those trophy fish aren't present, but uh, fairly reliably the opportunity is there to take a fish for a fish fry for a meal. Uh, quality or trophy objectives, where again, we're willing to sacrifice some of the harvest to ensure we get bigger, older fish uh, and, and deliver a slightly different um, experience, higher catch rates, higher catch rates of big fish. And then liberal harvest fisheries, where at times we have lakes uh, where mother nature pre prevents us from uh, necessarily being able to meet one of these objectives. Could be a very shallow system, could be very productive it uh, could be something that has a, a high prevalence of winter kill just tied to really, really high algae. 
uh, densities. And in that case, no matter what reg we apply to it, that fishery is always going to struggle to be consistent and dependable. And so we can look at it as an opportunity to take the maximum amount of fish from it that we can. The consequence being uh, at times the fishery might not be very good and at other times it might be great. And then ultimately, again, you know, what this comes down to is uh, each of those objectives is linked to a series of regulations, size limits, bag limits, closure seasons, the use of bait uh, that, that helps tell that story of what we're trying to deliver on that lake or river. Um, you know, the sport fishing guide is something that a lot of us interact with all the time, but because it's a very common thing and has been around for a long time, uh, you know, it's not unusual for people not to pick it up and not to read it every year. It's a really good idea to, to pick this thing up. There's lots of updates that happen in there. There's many great articles that people write uh, that give tips and tricks and share experiences with anglers that are out in the land base uh, and also point to, you know, where these changes, this regulation cycle uh, have occurred so that, that people can have the best experience. You know, what is that goal? What do I want for my angling day? This book helps you get that. Uh, we've also had the opportunity to develop a new uh, app for this. So, you know, moving from uh, having that hard paper copy um, to, to something on your phone that you can interact with uh, beyond just being on the website for the regulations uh, that help people have that sort of, uh, you know, reduced red tape. Uh, where am I? What do I want uh, to harvest? Bam, there's my, my reg and my opportunity. Uh, it's important to recognize that all of our fisheries, if you think about that allocation ladder, indigenous, recreational, uh, you know, commercial purposes, tournament guides, whatever, all of our fisheries are managed through some kind of regulatory framework. If we were thinking about indigenous fisheries, there's also a domestic fishing license that presents very similar um, rules and regulations to ensure that that activity happens. Uh, domestic fishing licenses reaffirm uh, that constitutionally protected right to fish for indigenous harvesters. Um, there is a default objective that would exist within that, which is subsistence harvest. So making sure that fishing for food and those cultural purposes uh, is able to happen. Uh, similarly, an opportunity to cut down on, um, you know, how that process used to be where, where fishers would have to come to the office to get a, a license. It's now available through Realm, just like recreational fishing licenses. Uh, there is a document online that presents the, the rules and conditions. Uh, so just like a recreational fishing license as well, it's valid for uh, a whole bunch of lakes and rivers and the, the uh, conditions uh, document that comes with it just lays out what the, the regulations are from a water body perspective. If we were thinking about Lesser Slave Lake and just looking at how the, the two things, recreational and indigenous licenses uh, kind of overlap, uh, obviously there's a mesh size for, for those wishing to set a net, uh, likely targeting Lake Whitefish and at different times of the year, other species. Uh, if they're using a rod and reel to, to meet a, a, a Métis harvesting or a treaty fishing right, uh, there's still the opportunity to catch species like walleye and pike, uh, as long as it's over 43 centimeters or 55 centimeters. Understanding again, the size limits that we choose typically have a conservation purpose to them, ensuring that uh, we are protecting fish that are immature or protecting some value that says, uh, you know, fish under or over this size are contributing to a population. And we want that. We want what they are providing back in there to meet that first objective, self-sustaining fisheries. Uh, if we flip the, to the other side of the coin there, and we think back to the recreational fishery, uh, through time, there have been a, a large number of regulations on, on many province or lakes in the province uh, that have been applied to lesser slave lake. We've seen minimum size limits, we've seen maximum size limits, we've seen combinations of those two things. Uh, we've seen uh, different bag limits at different seasons, which we have right now. Uh, for the recreational fishery, the, the size limits that we use, which we just saw on the indigenous uh, fishing slide there as well, of 43 centimeters as a minimum size limit for walleye and 55 centimeters for a minimum size limit for pike, uh, were established in 2008. So uh, again, we've, we've had a long run of these regulations being present on Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, 13 years, and it's a good opportunity to check back in with a bunch of work having been done to that point to see if the management objectives, if, if anglers and fishers on the lake want to see something else, uh, if, if the stocks are meeting those objectives. Uh, and also our management approach has evolved in that same time frame. So, you know, we're in a position now where we use fish management objectives that are, are more tightly defined than they, they were then uh, to kind of backcast and stitch together, well, what have we been managing for? So in the case of walleye sustainable harvest, 
in the case of pike uh, with a three fish bag limit and a 55 centimeter minimum size limit, that's a fairly liberal regulation. It's, it's protecting very little in terms of immature pike uh, in the fishery. Uh, species like perch, burbot, and whitefish don't have uh, management frameworks put together for them, uh, but they all have fairly high bag limits, 10 fish and 15 fish with no size limit. So we can term these as, as fairly liberal harvest opportunities for those species. So if we think back to the slide from earlier, we're, we're sitting there going, okay, well, we have regulations and we want to understand, is this fish population uh, meeting these objectives, the fishery meeting the objective? Uh, in order to do that, we monitor. When it comes to lakes, our number one monitoring uh, sort of technique is an index netting technique. Uh, so this was developed in Ontario and brought to Alberta, standardized and worked on here. Uh, we deploy this in lakes across the province, uh, typically in the fall season. Uh, it utilizes a gill net that has different mesh size panels that allow us to look at the structure of a population. And while we get a whole bunch of data from these gill nets, collecting data on, on species composition, uh, the two key metrics that we derive from it are abundance, how many fish are in the lake, and structure. What's the size and age class of each of those populations? The nets work better and worse for different species. Uh, we use them typically to look at walleye, pike, whitefish, perch, uh, which can overlap with the fish that usually are, are recreational and indigenous users are the most interested uh, in harvesting and, and we manage the most intensively for. Once we have that information about the stock, that's great. Those are just numbers, but we have to add context to that. So Alberta developed the Fish Sustainability Index or FSI, uh, which is essentially a report card system. If we think about that for walleye and pike. The figure you see on the right-hand side of the screen here is a map of Alberta with all of the walleye lakes that have been scored using this system. So we use that index netting data and uh, we've been able to analyze that to determine, okay, well, what is a high, medium and low density of fish uh, and correspondingly, what is a uh, low, medium, and high risk to fish sustainability? The more fish you have, the less risk you have. The less fish you have, the more risk you have. Uh, and as well, the more and less options you have for management. Uh, we put that into context of that system's natural capacity uh, when we think about then what objectives that those lakes could deliver. Then we can determine, is this performing, underperforming, uh, exceeding expectations? Uh, and allows us to bring it back to um, different stakeholders to, to check in on those objectives and determine what they want from the fishery. If we dig in for Lesser Slave Lake. And we're talking about walleye. Uh, Lesser Slave obviously is, is one of the largest water bodies in Alberta. I believe it's the largest drive to water body. It's uh, roughly uh, 119,000 square hectares, uh, big, big water. The West Basin of Lester Slave Lake right now is below the target that we would set out. Uh, so our, our desired target is a moderate risk, moderate abundance population. What we're seeing for walleye in the West Basin is it's, it's underneath that target. In the East Basin, uh, we're currently within the same FSI uh, category. So it's, it's moderate risk, um, not necessarily the, the kind of middle of that distribution, but in the right category. Uh, and then at a lake level, we're kind of teetering between uh, high and moderate risk uh, by thinking of by adding those two basins together to to think of it at a lake uh, at a lake level. Um, talking about those key metrics that we get from our index netting uh, abundance. So this is coming from the most recent survey that we did uh, on the lake, which was 2020. Uh, along the bottom of this figure is the number of adult walleye caught in our nets uh, in an in a overnight or 24-hour period. Uh, this translates into a density of fish in the lake. The more fish in the lake, the more fish we catch in the nets. And that's how we're able to put together the scoring, the, the categories, the thresholds uh, for where we want to see these high, medium, and low density, high, medium, and low risk uh, populations. Very interesting to note that we began to see a difference uh, after 2000 and uh, in the 2010 survey, so after the regulations were put in place in 2008, uh, there began to be a difference showing up in the basins. And before that, both basins uh, were performing relatively the same. Uh, one of the key differences, which we'll get into a little bit later, is, is just simply how those two basins are developed and continue to develop through time. The West Basin has a lot more access, a lot more camping opportunities, a lot more development opportunity. Uh, and as a result of that, there's just more effort there. So while people are fishing on Lesser Slave Lake, uh, it is not equally spread between the East and the West Basin. 
And after 2007, we began to see that in the population structure between the two basins. So, you know, really, when we think about this through time, when we look at this last survey, what does this say to us? Uh, it says, yeah, you know what, in the past, we have been where we want it to be in that moderate risk range. Uh, at the time, that's, that's where there was a lot of uh, different regulations tried over, under, different bag limits. People were able to harvest under those re regulations fairly regularly. And as a consequence, the density dropped from that desired target at moderate risk below that target. The regulations we have in place now have managed to sustain that fishery at a lake level uh, through time. But when we look at it and uh, break down that data, we understand that, that really uh, one of the two basins is underperforming and, and to ensure sustainability moving forward as populations grow, as development will continue, as the desire to have more people come and utilize and enjoy the fishery increases, we need to make sure the resiliency is there to deliver that for those users, all users. Uh, so yeah, that's, that is what we understand about Lesser Slave Lake right now for walleye. Uh, key points here. So the walleye are smaller in the West Basin. Uh, we do see a difference, not just in density, but in size and age. Uh, there is uh, six or seven more year classes present in the East Basin than there are in the West. Um, those impacts, as I had mentioned, kind of started showing up after the, the 2007 regs in 2010, and they have been present for the last three surveys that we've delivered. Uh, you know, so the crux of this is, uh, and again, considering how large the lake is, it straddles two MDs, has a number of hamlets, has 26 different access points on it, your fishing experience could be very different depending where you're going fishing and how regularly you're going there, how regularly you're trying different locations. Um, and year to year, just, just environmental effects. So it, there is quite a bit of variability that can happen. And you know, it, it is a complex fishery for us to kind of put a, a holistic picture together for. If we think about pike in Lesser Slave Lake, uh, regrettably, uh, we've kind of known for a long time that pike are uh, at a low abundance. Um, the previous regulation that was applied was intended to ensure a high harvest opportunity was not designed uh, to protect or see large fish be present. Uh, we've have heard through time that anglers do want to see better catchers. They do want to see larger fish. So with that in mind, we look at this going, well, Slave Lake can support uh, a moderate risk population. Uh, with that in mind, both the East and the West Basin are underperforming as far as density would go at the lake level. Uh, they are underperforming. And what's interesting to note is here, we don't see the discrepancy that we do in walleye between the two basins. Uh, predictably, uh, walleye are a much bigger focus. Uh, pike are at much lower numbers. They've been uh, consistently in that high risk category, meaning that both basins don't have the same density of fish, don't have a moderate density of fish in them, uh, and, and they simply don't get the, the harvest pressure that the walleye do. So uh, they are performing equitably, which is great, uh, but lower than what we would desire. So if, if or I shouldn't say we, lower than from a conservation and sustainability perspective, we would recommend. Uh, and from a, I want better pike fishing uh, stance, it, certainly there is room for improvement here. Um, Lake whitefish. Uh, Lake whitefish have also seen uh, a lot of change through time. Not a lot of this driven by uh, indigenous or recreational harvest. Uh, but when we look at the, the harvest results from our 2020 survey, uh, the catch rate, number of fish in our nets, uh, would also still indicate a low density population. Um, Lesser Slave Lake is a big lake. So even at a low catch rate, it's certainly representative of a lot of fish spread out across a very large water body. Uh, but to put context to what we see, to put context to those catch rates, we understand that, that from 2005 to 2020, a 15 year time period of sampling, uh, there has been a fairly consistent uh, decline uh, from 2005 to 2014 in whitefish stocks. At the time, commercial fishing was open and operating. Uh, we started to see the effects of that fishing around about 2011. Uh, there was a suspension in the West Basin fishery before the provincial closure in 2014. We were seeing those catch rates uh, drop off at, a, at an alarming rate. And those, that fishery was operating predominantly in the fall. So as these fish were coming into their spawning grounds, we just understood that fewer and fewer and fewer were actually there to kind of fill those nets. 
uh, since the closure, we've seen a small uh, improvement in whitefish. Um, the, the desired or intended objective for whitefish on Slave Lake is actually recovery. Whitefish uh, and their, their cousins, the Cisco or Tulabi, play a very important role in fish populations. And, and as we said earlier on in the talk, one of our intentions is to understand fish stocks and understand uh, what's happening with that community of fish. And so a number of people have expressed concerns about Lake Whitefish and what changes in abundance might mean and uh, a fairly significant management action, which was the closure of the commercial fishery at a provincial level, uh, meant that a large number of whitefish uh, were no longer being harvested from uh, Lesser Slave Lake. But again, applying context to that, we were seeing declines in the whitefish catch rates in that fishery. Uh, management actions were taking place within commercial fishing uh, to try and sustain those catch rates and allow stocks to at least normalize or improve. Uh, it's important to recognize that, that no matter what the type of fishing, recreational, indigenous, commercial, those are not management tools. Those are ways to utilize fish stocks that require management frameworks. So commercial fishing was a type of fishery that needed management. It was not helping to manage uh, the fish stocks necessarily. Uh, we understood that, that the harvest could be sustainable and for many years it was. Uh, but when that started to decline, we, we saw the need to take actions as well to protect that uh, indigenous fishery and those harvesting opportunities. Uh, and as we're seeing uh, whitefish numbers slowly start to climb, we now see that there are more um, opportunities available for recreational fishers as well, catching these with rod and reel. Uh, there's many lakes in Alberta that have very strong whitefish angling fisheries. Uh, and at a 10 fish limit, it's a great opportunity for people to access fish uh, for meat to take home. So we are seeing that you know small increase. We're seeing uh, in catch rate recruitment back into the fishery, but it's still nowhere near where it was 15 years ago. And so while people may see a lot of whitefish on a camera or be concerned, there isn't any actual uh, data or, or uh, literature that would point out that, that whitefish stocks are dangerous to other fish. I've heard many things about, oh, well, you know, they might eat eggs, but they're not specialists. They're not simply going in to eat one species egg. Um, we have a lot of our fish that travel up river systems to spawn. They're certainly not following them all the way up those river systems to eat those, uh, all of those eggs. So in an untouched fishery, we would expect to see uh, very abundant populations of whitefish and pike and walleye and any other species that happen to be present there. And if we think back even in the history of lesser slave, that was certainly true. And that's why those lakes were attractive to start to utilize those fish populations in. They were there and they were there in abundant numbers. So we think about Lesser Slave Lake and, and how people fish it and where people go to fish it, no matter what the purpose. Uh, again, it is a large water body. And so people tend to think of it from where they go, if that's Bruce Point Park, if that's Shaw's Point, uh, if that's Devonshire Beach. Um, but there are a lot of different access points onto Lesser Slave Lake. You know, right now there are 13 different marinas in total, 26 different boat launches. Uh, you know, you could spend uh, years fishing a couple sections of this lake that would, that would be tantamount to your own Sturgeon Lake in size or your own monogamy in size uh, and never even move from the east or the west basin. So you can have very different uh, fishing experiences just depending on where you launch, which shore you're fishing. Uh, and, you know, as many people would know from fishing this lake, the weather can be very detrimental. Slave Lake gets big waves and big water. Uh, the West Basin tends to offer more shelter than the East Basin does. Uh, and so depending on the nature of the day, it, it might restrict where you choose to go fishing from, even just for how many people you're putting on your boat, the size of your boat. Uh, and those things have, have also begun to uh, expand and increase through time. There is that desire for more people to be able to utilize this great resource. Uh, but with that comes the, the need to sort of capture all that in a holistic viewpoint as well. And so what does all that mean? How does that translate into the actual recreational fishery? Uh, well, we measure fish stocks with index nets, and that allows us to count how many and look at structure. Uh, we look at the fishery itself, if we're thinking about recreational fishing, uh, using creel surveys. We go to boat launches, we talk to anglers, we ask how many fish they caught, we measure those fish. Uh, there have been a number of these surveys done between 1986 and 2014 on Lesser Slave Lake. So we kind of look at that data set uh, and take averages from it 
we understand, uh, and, and focusing really more particularly in the, the surveys between 2005 and 14, uh, in which we had four creels, uh, we see anywhere between 80 and 100,000 anglers, depending on a bunch of different things that can be happening. Uh, obviously, COVID, something we've all dealt with here for now a couple uh, years, has had different effects to this. We've seen increases in license sales, so that has a bump at a water body level. Um, and this, this uh, attention lesser slave gets, again, is not even. We think about the last figure. We know more people are fishing on the West Basin than are fishing on the East Basin by virtue of that access. Uh, in an open water season, we can expect to see anywhere between 350 and 440,000 walleye caught. And that can translate depending on the year and the stock that's status at the time. Uh, anywhere between a third and half of the fish in, the, in a lake as big as Lesser Slave Lake can be handled by anglers. Uh, we saw that in some of the comments uh, prior to the, the presentation starting of, oh, I can have a 60 fish night. Uh, and certainly, you know, if you have that across uh, 100,000 people, if everyone's having that experience, you could touch 600,000 fish. Um, but again, it's it's interesting to note that that the number of fish caught it is not split up equally. We see more fish handled in the West Basin than we do in the East Basin because there's more people fishing there. Uh, in terms of pike, we know the stocks are low, so we expect fewer fish to be caught. Uh, you know, that's that's between you know here 66 and 82,000 ish. That's a range. Uh, a much lower proportion of the population. Walleye are uh, by far and away the more prevalent species. A lot of people are happy to catch a pike. Some people do target them. Most folks are out there uh, looking for walleye. And then how does this translate into harvest? So, you know, we can see anywhere between 60 and 70,000 walleye uh, taken out of the lake every year. Uh, in some years in the past, it's been higher than that, depending on what the bag limits were. Uh, at a one fish bag limit in the summer, this is, this is representative of that harvest. Uh, and pike again, uh, much lower. So even at a three fish bag limit, uh, we know recreational fishers are just not taking a lot of pike not surprisingly, because there isn't a great population there. And so overall, again, what that means is even on a lake the size of Lesser Slave, it's it's easy to handle a large number of fish. The consequences of that, depending on where you are, can be different. Uh, and we're seeing it in that assessment data in terms of uh, differences between the West and the East basins. Uh, if you change seasons and you move from the open water fishery to the hard water fishery, lots changes. Fish behavior changes, water temperature behavior, behavior, water temperatures change, their behavior in relation to that changes as fish. You don't have any fewer or more fish, but how you catch them and their, their desire to bite hooks definitely is impacted. Uh, Lesser Slave has far less angling pressure in the winter, uh, admittedly, and we'll get into this in our sustainability threats. These, these are based on uh, surveys that are a bit older, uh, but at the time we saw between two and 6,000 anglers present in the winter, again, fraction of what we see in the open water season, uh, and the harvest of both walleye and pike much lower in the winter than we see in the open water season. This was one of the reasons why at that time, uh, 2008, when the current regulations were set, we were able to have one fish limit in the summer and two fish limit in the winter. Uh, there was less, less effort and uh, the catch rates were lower. So we move from talking about the fish and the fishery uh, to talking about some of these sustainability threats. So what are the things that can happen around fishing that potentially influence that experience, that opportunity, influence fish stocks? Uh, compliance, compliance can be a concern. Um, again, this can be amplified depending on how that pressure is split up. If we know we have more people fishing on the West Basin, uh, there could be higher um, incidences of non-compliance present there. What does that mean? That can be over limits, people taking uh, and regrettably, this happens, and, and I appreciate the efforts of our officers to, to uh, you know, efficiently, quickly, and, and effectively deal with this. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the officers have caught people that are grossly over limits, double digits of fish, 20, 30 fish in their possession, uh, undersized fish, uh, or you get people that will go out multiple times a day to take one fish. All of this is just tantamount to theft. It, it, you know, the regulations that are applied to the water body are not designed to deal with folks choosing not to follow them. That will obviously have a consequence to the sustainability of the fishery and the, the stability of fish stocks. Uh, we also get incidences like trafficking fish. So if people are selling, catching and selling fish for profit, uh, that's not part of our current management regime. And that is you know, adding to that problem. And, and this is, as many things are, a cumulative effects problem. Uh, so one of our our big takeaways is please, 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 if you see something or you think you see something that is 
uh, not right, please phone report a poacher. Uh, the numbers on the screen here, as well as the website, you can remain anonymous. Uh, even if, if an officer has to come from uh, a different place in the district to respond to this, uh, the more times that we have uh, people calling in to say, oh, we have a problem here, I can help our, our officers go, okay, we need to focus efforts into different places. We know we have some issues here. Uh, all that data is valuable. So please, we, we absolutely see uh, recreational Indigenous tournament fishers, everybody that's out there utilizing the resource, uh, whether that's from a kayak or a, you know, a big fishing boat, uh, we're all stewards of the resource. And, and so that is a shared role is helping keep that resource safe. Uh, data gaps, uh, you know, there is obviously uh, issues that can arise if, if we uh, are not able to get out and monitor frequently. Lesser Slave is a big water body. Uh, we monitor it uh, ideally, uh, in, you know, to ensure that, that regulations and the objectives are being met. Uh, but there's time that happens in between that, which is, is usually okay, particularly if the data continues to say, ah, you know what, this is meeting the objective. We don't need to look as frequently if there hasn't been a big change. Uh, but with data staleness and with changes in a whole bunch of different things that we have no control over, the consequence to that can be um, felt in the fish stocks and burdened by fishers. Uh, so we need to continue to go out. We need to continue to monitor. We monitor fish stocks with that index netting. We monitor the fishery by talking to recreational fishers, talking to indigenous fishers, getting a sense of things like uh, on Lesser Slave in the winter. Many people have said, man, I cannot believe how the number of shacks have changed over time. Uh, is that significant? Is that double? Is that is that winter fishery now much uh, more significant than it was uh, in 2007? Those are data gaps that we need to assess so that we don't underestimate risk. Uh, uninformed uh, folks, we've, the uh, AEP has done a great uh, deal to try and enhance our online tools. Many thanks to folks like uh, uh, Janine and Alyssa, who help us develop those things, improve our websites, uh, reduce red tape, get things onto people's smartphones so that we can all be informed when we're on the landscape. Or if we have a question, how are fish stocks in Lesser Slave Lake doing? You can find that report online. You can find that FSI status. You, you can understand how those things are scored. Easy to share with people. You can determine from a regulation, what objective is this lake uh, delivering? And what do I want for my fishing day today? Um, yeah, so there's different places, again, that we would like people to go. There's videos on our AEP YouTube channel. Uh, there's a number of resources on My Wild Alberta. Please spend time there. Uh, go through that. Uh, find things that you don't understand. Ask us questions. Uh, this is a dialogue. This is a relationship between us as fisheries biologists and folks that use this, this resource and feel passionately about it. Other things that happen that are outside the realm of fishing and fisheries, uh, things like land use planning. So there is a cumulative effect of all things that happen around us. Uh, we are part of ecosystems. We have peers that we mentioned earlier on in the presentation that, that are responsible for managing those things. Within fisheries, we try to track and model the consequences of those impacts on fisheries, helping us describe what objectives are viable and what we can expect from different populations. So bringing this to a close, uh, we understand that Lesser Slave Lake is, is a culturally and socially important fishery. Um, it, it's obviously very clear, careful management is needed to ensure sustainability uh, in how we continue to utilize and fish on this lake, all of us. Um, we have regrettably observed collapses and degradations in the past and uh, there's no silver bullet to recovery. Um, so it, it, it is something that we wish to avoid and manage with resiliency uh, to, to ensure that we aren't headed that way. Um, the shared objective is to allow sustainable harvest and, and maintain fish stocks for generations to come for all users in that allocation pyramid uh, to use to meet their desired objectives. And, and we recognize this is a partnership and a cooperation. It's, it's what we need to be successful. And what does being successful mean? At the end of the day, that's, that's happy anglers, it's increased uh, tourism opportunities, uh, it's better experiences, and that is ensuring that we're meeting those Indigenous fishing uh, rights and needs. Um, when I started, I said there's different resources that are available online. Uh, please see uh, Michael Short, Let's Go Outdoors, has a, a small vignette on Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, we have some fact sheets and information sheets. My Wild Alberta is full of information. Uh, and we're going to spend the next bit of time here uh, answering questions.
hopefully sharing some of that information. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Great, thank you, Miles. So um, as mentioned, we're going to move into our question and answer portion of the evening. So I'll invite the panel to turn their video cameras back on and join us again. And just a reminder for folks, Ryan is uh, joining us from the field in his truck, so he's not going to turn his video camera on for this evening, but he is here. Um, so if you have any questions from Miles' great presentation that he just gave, um, or anything that wasn't covered in the presentation around Lesser Slave Lake, um, please go ahead and type that into the Q&A function. So again, along the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see the Q&A tool. I see we've got one question that's come in so far. So go ahead and type your questions in there um, and we will start to respond to them as the panel. So um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are going to be starting with some of the pre-submitted questions. So again, when you registered, you said, um, or you were uh, able to provide questions for things that you'd like to hear more about. Um, so the first one comes from Travis, and Travis is wondering how come Indigenous people still catch fish that everyone cannot keep due to low populations? It should be everyone or no one. Yeah, and, and I can take a run at this, Janine. So, you know, thanks to Travis for uh, providing that question and just uh, another welcome to everyone that's uh, joined us maybe since the introduction here tonight as well. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us tonight talking about Lesser Slave Lake. Um, so Travis, when uh, when Miles talked earlier uh, about Alberta's management system, uh, you know that's taken right from our fish and wildlife policy, and and that system reflects first and foremost the conservation, uh, or that conservation is the highest priority for species, and and those conservation actions actually do apply to all resource users. Um, so examples of those actions, Miles highlighted them. Uh, that's the West End closure in Lester Slave Lake. Uh, that's the spring closure we see on Slave Lake as well as other uh, lakes across the province. It also applies as minimum size limits that protect uh, fish from harvest long enough so that they can spawn multiple times. So once we once those conservation objectives are met and set, um, Indigenous fishing rights are protected under the Canadian Constitution. Uh, and in Alberta, Indigenous people have the right to fish for subsistence for themselves and the immediate family members. And, and it's important to remember this is prioritized over recreational sport fishing. Um, Indigenous fishing is facilitated through a domestic fishing license. Miles talked about that uh, a little bit earlier as well. And those contain those same conservation-based conditions and, and rules. So um, when you see minimum size limits in uh, the recreational angling guide, uh, those are reflected also in the domestic fishing license. Uh, conditions and rules. Uh, in order to meet subsistence requirements, fishers may have bag limits though that differ from recreational users. And, and why that difference? Uh, well, what we do know is that there are much fewer, many fewer Indigenous subsistence fishers than there are recreational users. And, and Miles you know, demonstrated that in regards to uh, what we have for knowledge on recreational uh, licensing use uh, versus domestic uh, and subsistence use. So because the number of recreational users, especially on Western Slave Lake, uh, those, those big numbers that Miles showed uh, we do require more restrictive bag limits uh, to be used in order to ensure that we meet all those three objectives so that they can be achieved. So number one, it's meeting that conservation objective. Number two, um, meeting our objectives for Indigenous fishing and subsistence use, and then uh, that recreational management objectives. So when we when we choose recreational fisheries management objectives, that's, that's where we come to the public and, and talk about those different uh, objectives miles laid out, uh, it's possible that the regulations will actually differ uh, from the conservation-based regulations associated with Indigenous fisheries objectives. So in summary, Travis, uh, conservation-based regulations apply to all users. Uh, beyond conservation regulations, you know, there may be differences in regulations between users based on the priority of them and the applicable management objectives for each of those uses. So uh, that was a really long answer, Janine, here for Travis's question, but um, certainly feel free to, uh, to follow up, Travis. Great, thanks, Kaden. A long answer, but a good answer. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jeannie. Uh, so our next question comes from Brian, and we actually had this um, question come up quite a few times, so both through our Facebook post that we've been putting out on My Wild Alberta and through some of the questions being submitted here. Um, and Brian is wondering what can be done to minimize the algae problem that seems to worsen annually? Hey, Brian. Um, yeah, we do get this question quite a bit. So algae occurs in a lot of our water bodies and water courses across Alberta. We're lucky to have some incredibly productive lakes in the sense that we have algae and algae is an important part to ecosystems. So it plays a role as a food for fish at different uh, stages of their life cycle. 
Um, however, um, algae in high numbers, especially in the summer or winter, can cause issues for oxygen in the lake or biologically dissolved oxygen uh, availability and supply. So we see it in both instances. Algae can be really good for fish. It can be harmful to fish at certain times of year in large numbers. So one of the leading causes or drivers in algae production is nutrification, so phosphorus and nitrogen. One thing that we can think about in our lakes and in our planning cycles is maintaining those riparian areas and those wetlands around our lakes that help to support and catch that overland runoff and really taking a look at what we're applying at a landscape level. So if you're a lakeshore owner or a development owner along the lake, you might want to think about reducing the amount of fertilizers you're putting on your property because anything that runs off of that runs into the lake. So those are some of the drivers behind uh, algae production and algae growth. We are seeing this at a number of water bodies across um, the province, and it's not exclusive to Alberta. I hope that helps answer your question. Thanks, Christy. All right, so I see lots of questions coming in uh, live, which is great. So again, if you see a question that's already written there that you'd like to see the answer to, go ahead and hit that upvote button. And we will be moving into sort of the live Q&A. Um, after our last pre-submitted question, which comes from Robin. And Robin is wondering, uh, what are we doing about overfishing and enforcement? Good evening, folks. My name is Ryan Green. I'm the unit inspector with the Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Service stationed here in High Prairie. Good question, Robin. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Enforcement uh, Service plans uh, fisheries enforcement activities around fishery priorities received by fisheries management. Throughout the year, you'll see fish and wildlife officers patrolling Lesser Slave Lake uh, on the ice, in, on the water, and around the shorelines. Um, as Miles stated earlier before, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Service depends uh, quite a bit actually on public information on fishery abuse. The more complaints we get on certain areas regarding uh, fisheries abuse, uh, we have the ability to spend more time in those areas and deal with uh, infractions as they come up. Uh, fish and wildlife officers are on call 24 seven and can be reached through reporter poacher line. Um, a recent example of the public assist assisting fish and, wildlife and fish and wildlife enforcement service is uh, the recent conclusion of an undercover operation which concluded in January of 2020. Uh, in total, there was two groups of uh, individuals that were trafficking fish. Uh, the fish were, were, one group of individuals were trafficking fish right from Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, the other groups, group of traffickers were trafficking fish uh, from uh, Wenogme Lake and Lesser Slave Lake. Um, in total, the Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Service uh, seized 12,000 pounds of fish and uh, 33 people were charged with numerous offenses uh, and one vehicle was seized. Uh, talking about that, that fish trafficking file, a lot of the information that we were able to act on um, did come from the public. So it's very important uh, that when folks are out in the landscape and they see something that's not right, Great, thanks Ryan. And thanks for providing that uh, recent example too. That's really great. All right, so I see folks have figured out the upvoting button, which is fantastic. Uh, so we're going to start off with a question from Derek this evening. Um, and Derek is wondering, when you do your fall index netting, how do you choose where to place your nets? Um, I ask because you could place nets at 20 different locations and get very low numbers of walleye. Um, but it could also show you it places in both basins that hold huge numbers of both pike and walleye. Hi, Derek. Uh, so Miles mentioned it a little bit in his presentation. So when we do an index netting survey, our survey is designed using a stratified random sampling design. It's kind of a big fancy word for trying to understand that we're sampling the entire lake. So we want to not only look at the places that have good fish, and we know that fish live there, but we want to take a look at each location in the lake. And it's important to take a look at what's living deep, what's living shallow, and get an equal representation of what the lake is holding. This helps us 
form an overall picture of what our species look like, not only in the really good fishing areas, but also in the areas that we don't have fish necessarily all year. This is the total distribution of fish for the lake. And that's where we base a lot of our management um, recommendations off of. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, if we sampled all the good places, which I know there's a lot of anglers out there that have some pretty great fishing spots, um, we would get an artificially inflated or a higher estimate than what's truly in the lake. So we want to make sure that when we're taking a look at the lake, we're not only sampling the really good spots, but we're getting an accurate picture of what's in the lake as a whole. I hope that helps answer your question. If you have any follow-up questions on that study design, uh, please send us an email. Happy to answer further. Great. Thanks, Christy. So our next question comes from Michael, and Michael is wondering, how does extirpation of lake trout back in the 1900s currently fit into the fisheries management objectives of Lesser Slave Lake? I can give some information on this, uh, Janine. Uh, so thank you for asking the question, Michael. Uh, first things first, it is not a myth. Yes, Lesser Slave Lake once contained uh, lake trout. Those fish were uh, commercially harvested starting in 1915. Uh, there's there is some federal catch records and a number of books that actually highlight how that went. Uh, regrettably, what was unknown at the time was uh, how robust that stock was. And, and as Christy just talked about with our sampling method and, and why we want to use standardized methods, uh, it's so we can understand what the, the fragility and what the risks and what the uh, sustainable harvest of a stock might look like. Uh, right now, as they are extirpated, lake trout sadly don't feature in our management objectives for Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, since their loss around about uh, 1930, um, this fishery has, has you know, entered into a new stable state. Walleye certainly are, uh, for recreational fishers, the, the predominant um, target species, uh, followed by pike. And, and obviously with those other fisheries like indigenous, we pay attention to whitefish. Um, the future of lake trout in Lesser Slave Lake uh, is an interesting discussion, but as much as I wish to at times fantasize about it, we have to take into consideration how water quality has changed, what those objectives are, what the reintroduction of a top order predator could mean to it. Uh, it's certainly not a conversation we would shy away from, uh, but in terms of immediate objectives, it's it's the management of the species that are there. Uh, and we can leave a placeholder for uh, fun conversations about uh, giants of, of uh, past generations. Great, thank you. Our next question here comes from Brian, and Brian is wondering if stocking is an option. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to give Miles and Christy a break here, Janine, and maybe jump in here, Brian. Um, so Brian, I, you know, I think based upon what Miles presented tonight, I'm, I don't think I'm making a leap to indicate that you're talking about walleye stocking, maybe to uh, supplement the existing numbers there. Um, so many folks in Alberta probably realized that uh, Fish and Wildlife did reinitiate the walleye stocking program uh, the past couple of years. And, uh, and that was reflected this year with uh, stocking that took place in Southern Alberta uh, and in a, just a couple of water bodies in Northeast Alberta. And I, I think maybe it's a, uh, a good reminder for us in terms of where we prioritize walleye stocking in Alberta, and that's based upon you know where, where we've seen success and maybe less less success in other jurisdictions, including Alberta. And you know first and foremost, where we found success is restorative stocking. So uh, where we've had water bodies like a Lac La Biche, uh, like a Wabman Lake, where uh, walleye were pretty much functionally extirpated, I, meaning that they essentially were in such low numbers at the lake, we didn't detect them. Uh, and in those cases, you know, the stocking of walleye has been quite successful. Uh, we've also used it and, and looking to use it maybe more over the next few years in terms of providing what we're going to call put, grow and take fisheries. So these are water bodies where we would be able to put walleye, uh, grow them, and then we would be looking at, as, as Miles indicated earlier, utilizing things like a liberal harvest uh, objective, for instance, where those walleye are growing, uh, at, some, at some point they're catchable by anglers. And uh, because there's no conservation issue there, uh, we would be encouraging the harvest of those. Um, and then regulations maybe to, to 
meter them out, so to speak. Where we haven't seen very much success, uh, not only in Alberta, but in other jurisdictions, is stocking where we do have existing walleye populations. So stocking uh, walleye fry or fingerlings where we have um, a reasonably good uh, population of walleye. And so that's where we're at with, with Lesser Slave Lake. Um, Miles could chime in here, but we do have still, um, you know, while we might have low numbers, especially as Miles indicated, maybe more so in the West Basin than in the East, um, what we do indicate is we still have a fairly good biomass. We're, we're in a position where I think uh, we're able to still talk options. And I think in those instances, um, we, we're likely to see more success through natural spawning, making sure that there's habitat available, uh, making sure that we still have uh, a good population of, of females and males, uh, and that we'll see more success rather than a, a pretty significant investment is what, is what it would take in order to uh, you know, go down a walleye stocking program for Lesser Slave Lake. Um, going forward. So Brian, I, I hope that does answer your question. Feel free to follow up if, if I didn't get the species right on that. So. Great. Thanks, Kadon. Uh, so our next question here is from Darren, and lots of people are interested to hear a response to this, but do you have data on the perch numbers? Is it an area of concern or is that an area that needs more data? I can uh, take some time for to respond to this. Uh, so uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, so uh, yes, we do have data on perch and lesser slave lake. The value of our index netting protocol and how the nets are set, uh, they sample the community of fish. So uh, lesser slave uh, actually has is 15 or 16 different species of fish that are in it. Uh, there's five or six that tend to be the ones that people focus on. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch in there like uh, sculpin and trout perch and a whole bunch of different minnow species, which we, we also catch in our nets. So we do see perch catches. Uh, we don't tend to see high numbers of perch catches uh, in our nets. Um, we see a broad size class structure. We see a broad age class structure, uh, but not, not high densities when we compare that to other systems. Uh, I don't view it as a current area of concern. We see consistent recruitment. We see growth. We see bigger fish. Uh, if we were managing for desired higher densities of perch, I think we would have a lot of questions to wrap our head around as to, uh, are they there? Are we not sampling them? Uh, is there something within our survey that says that we need to look more focally at that? That could mean setting uh, more nets. Uh, we tend to set our nets um, with sort of a progressive uh, strategy so that we are collecting information on our most focal species and we can stop and we've answered the biological questions we need to. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that is what I would say at this point in time. Thanks, Miles. Um, and in relation to some of the other species that might be found in Lesser Slave Lake, we have a question here from Keith, who's wondering, uh, they were saying that the news has stated that some people are interested in the development of Devonshire Beach. My understanding is that might jeopardize bait species habitat. Is that correct? Hey Keith, um, I'll start by saying I'm not entirely sure what the plans are for Devonshire Beach, uh, but within the park, I've had conversations with our parks biologists in the past. Um, so beach habitat is really interesting habitat uh, and we've got a lot of it here right north of town in Devonshire Beach. Um, the beach habitat and the fringe habitat, uh, that area where you get willows and alders kind of just coming into the shoreline can be really important uh, coverage for fish as well as refugia for fish. So in the past, we have taken a look at um, trying to quantify bait fish in Lesser Slave Lake. Back in 2010, we added some small panel mesh to some of our nets. However, um, sampling along the beach shore hasn't been something that we've done in the very present era. Um, having said that, uh, we do know that bait fish, um, so shiners, uh, various varieties of shiners, as well as perch, congregate and spawn over fine materials. Um, and the beach and beaches in Lesser Slave Lake do provide that habitat. So if you're out there with kids or just waiting around or going out to fish from shore, you'll often see those little guys around your toes. So yes, the beaches and the fringe habitat do provide cover and an important habitat for smaller fish species within the lake. Great, thanks Christy. So moving on to our next question here comes from Derek and Derek says, since walleye and lesser slave lake are extremely slow growing, approximately 10 plus years to reach over 55 centimeters, 
why don't you consider limiting or eliminating the retention of much smaller numbers of larger walleye? Look at Lac La Biche, it now has some of the best walleye fishing in Alberta. Uh, I, I can uh, provide some insights there, Janine. Uh, so thanks, Derek, I appreciate uh, the question. Uh, yeah, you know, not just Lesser Slave, but a number of uh, walleye lakes in Alberta, we see that, that um, growth trend. So, you know, it can take uh, up to 10 to 15 years for those fish to reach 55 centimeters. Uh, when I was talking about our fisheries management system, again, that what regulations we might use, whether it's a minimum size limit or a maximum or a slot, uh, is certainly intended to deliver a certain type of fishery. Uh, minimum size limits have been very effective for us to recover walleye across the province, uh, beginning when the walleye management strategy came out in 95. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea that the protection of those big fish is valuable at an individual level, those fish carry a lot of eggs. Uh, we know in, in even an unfished population, the longer those fish are in the lake, the fewer and fewer of them there tend to be. Uh, so there can be utility in protecting those fish in terms of their egg contributions. Uh, we do tend to see though, the most eggs being contributed into a fishery from the younger uh, mature year classes. So it really just depends what objective we're trying to achieve. If we said, you know what, we want to see uh, more retention of quality and trophy sized fish in slave, then the current reg at 43 centimeters wouldn't be very appropriate. Uh, the interesting part there is we know that that effort isn't prohibitive in the East Basin as an example, where we see fish out to 70 centimeters. We see fish that are uh, five pounds. That's, that's taken a long time since 2005 uh, for those fish to show up. So there is utility in looking at those different reg options and certainly something we'll be doing uh, leading into engagement sessions later on. Uh, the intention being, what is that objective? Uh, the trade-off there can be there's less harvest opportunity if uh, folks are unable to find fish in that slot limit. Uh, whether that's a harvest or a protected slot, uh, and how that's going to actually work in the West versus the East Basin. On the West Basin, where we see uh, slightly lower uh, numbers in terms of stocks, and a, a, we didn't see that data here today, but we, you know, we can show it, is uh, we know we have six or seven fewer year classes there. We have more size class truncation. If we apply that slot limit in the West Basin, we may not immediately read, might not immediately realize any uh, protection from it. The fish will still need to grow through that that harvest period to get into the protected period or size class. Uh, with slow growth, that means that they'll spend a lot of time in that harvest slot. So uh, it's all a careful balance in how we want the tool to work and how the fish uh, are in in the system, and then what objective we're trying to achieve. So uh, it's not that we wouldn't consider it. I think it is uh, something that we could model, and it would really come back around to what are we trying to deliver. It's, if it's maximum harvest opportunity, that will limit some of that. Uh, if it's a balance between harvest opportunity and size, could be an option. Great, thanks, Miles. Uh, so another question about the walleye here. In 2020, a lot of skinny and light-colored walleye were caught, and we were told they were starving. In 2021, very few of those same fish were caught. Do you know what the food supply is now for walleye? And was it affected by the lower water levels in 2020 or the higher levels in 2021? Hey there, I'm gonna answer this one. So um, fish come in a number of colors, even uh, by the species. So a walleye can appear very dark or very light. Some of it's dependent on the fish itself. Some of it's dependent on the habitat. And anybody who's harvested a walleye uh, and has seen it in their boat about 20 minutes after it was harvested uh, can kind of see that color starting to fade very quickly. So coloration is a little bit subjective on fish and uh, it can range quite widely, even within the same species in the same lake. Um, as for uh, skinny fish, we've heard this term quite a bit uh, over the last couple of years, but if you think of walleye and fish kind of like you think of people, they come in different body shapes and sizes, and a lot of that is reflecting the condition, so how that fish is doing and where it's putting its energy. So fish at certain points of their life cycle will pump a lot of that energy instead of getting big and say body fat size, they'll put that energy into their gonads, so they might be getting ready to spawn, and that's maybe where they're putting their energy. 
Um, as far as food goes, um, we do see a lot of different food species for walleye in Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, in the recent survey, we took a look in some of the stomachs and walleye are pretty, uh, they take advantage of whatever can fit in their mouth. So you can find walleye with other baby walleye in their mouths. Uh, one of our made food fish species that we were seeing inside both pike and walleye were uh, whitefish and cisco. So um, with our whitefish and cisco numbers uh, starting to increase over time, hopefully uh, we'll see more of that food production um, but as of right now, we're seeing good fit walleye. Um, in the last survey that was conducted in 2020, we saw some really nice body fat on some of our walleye uh, when they were opened up for a biological assessment. So I hope that helps answer your question a little bit. Janine, if, if I could just add just real quickly on it too, like I, I know we do get questions as well. I think we've got saw some of the panel or some of the Q&A tonight too. Uh, and Christy, you feel free to jump in is where we do see things like, um, uh, what, what could be conceived as tumors, viral infections, things like that on, you know, within the walleye populations and, and other fish species. And, you know, I, I think typically what you'll hear from advice for us, for folks that might catch those, is uh, many of the many of the infections are are almost skin in nature and don't actually affect them, you know, the muscle tissue, which is ultimately what we're eating uh, for consumption. Uh, I think we just caution uh, folks, if you're not sure, you do catch the fish, you're not sure, uh, release it. Um, uh, it, it's not going to harm the population as a whole to, to release that fish back into the population um, rather than potential wastage on it. Uh, and I think uh, Christy and Miles would probably both encourage if, if you do have questions on that, uh, if you have a photo available for that fish, et cetera, if you are throwing it back uh, or if you choose to consume it and have a photo of that, uh, we, we'd be happy to try to answer that question for you. There are a number of naturally occurring infections uh, that might be either internal or external to those fish. Um, like say, most of them aren't going to affect the palatability. Uh, or the edibility of fish, but uh, use caution is is what we tell folks as well. So, thanks, Adon. I think I'm just Miles going to read out the one question here that, from Brian, just in case you want to add on to it, because I think you've already responded to it very well, Kadon. But Brian just said, I have noticed more bumps and tumors. Not sure what they are called on walleye in recent years. Why is this, and can one eat the fish with these tumors? And then go ahead, Miles, if you want to add on to what Kadon said. Oh, I, and and I mean, uh, Kate on nailed it there. And maybe just uh, the thing I wanted to point to again is is uh, some of the resources we have online. So there's actually some cool uh, fact sheets that provide uh, pictures of of what these things look like and an explanation of them, uh, kind of what their origin is. Uh, and so yeah, if you look on My Wild Alberta, uh, you can find some information sheets on these things, and um, they're pretty handy to kind of have uh, you know the digital downloaded version. Uh, and, and it's easy when you're sitting around a fire, then you'd be like, oh, you know, is this, is this what we saw? Oh, great. That's where it came from. Um, and I just wanted to add one other comment that I do feel is something that's very unique to Lesser Slave Lake that in the whole span of conversations around condition and stuff is, again, when we're dealing with a lake that is 1,190 some odd square kilometers in size, a large number of the walleye in Lesser Slave Lake utilize the South Heart River on the west side as the spawning tributary. And some of those fish, which through telemetry studies and other studies, we recognize they might spend their entire year uh, hanging out off of Devonshire. And then they are crossing 100 kilometers of lake uh, and then going 50 kilometers up a river uh, to do their spawning. So the walleye in Slave Lake at times can undergo huge spawning migrations, which is very interesting that they're able to one, maintain the body condition that Christy mentioned, uh, but two, their energy needs are, are substantial for where they are going to spawn, knowing that most of them run rivers versus spawn in the lake. Uh, I think that's probably the benefit, uh, like Christy mentioned, of improving uh, whitefish and cisco and having so many different uh, species available on the menu for shiners and minnows and things. So they are opportunistic uh, and the buffet is full. So on that note, Miles, there is actually a question from Joe here that's saying, is there any chance of tagging fish to see their mig migration, since you were just speaking about the migration that we know that some walleye take? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and and there actually, uh, there was a tagging program uh, in about 1992 to 1996 uh, that was done in partnership between uh, the government of Alberta and our peers at the ACA, Alberta Conservation uh, Association. That report is available online. Uh, and provide some really cool maps. So uh, is there an opportunity to do it again? Uh, I guess, yes, there would be that opportunity. Commonly, when we're thinking about what studies we would need to do, it is around, have we seen a change in a population? Have we seen some kind of a change that we're saying, 
we need to assess uh, that change in order to determine if there's a management action. At this point, I would say we have a pretty reasonable handle on where, when, and kind of how those fish migrate. Uh, so I, I wouldn't see a management need for repeating such a thing, uh, but looking at that uh, work that's been done and just recognizing that uh, it is pretty cool, uh, it is an opportunity that's out there. And I can follow up after the fact with, uh, with that report, which I believe is on the ACA's website. Great, thanks, Miles. All right, so we have another question here from Bill and Bill is wondering, uh, when I track the fishing numbers and species, is there anyone locally that would want this information? I supply catches to U of A research group through Angler's Atlas. Yeah, um, so, so it's a great question. Uh, it's actually not an uncommon question, Bill and, and Janine on it. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, um, what we do see is a lot of folks that are engaged, uh, want to provide information. Uh, I think the one thing that we find in between periods, I think as Miles indicated, so 2014 was the last time we did, uh, you know, a standardized index netting, gill netting program on Lesser Slave Lake. You know, and, and in that time since, uh, you know, Miles, Christy, myself, others across the province, you know, the folks that are out there utilizing the, the fishery, um, there, there are a lot of our eyes and ears on the ground. I, I think Ryan sees that on, on the enforcement compliance side as well. Uh, the quick answer, Bill, is I, I'm glad you're you're, you're working through Angler's Atlas and, and Sean's app over there. Um, I don't, from the AEP perspective, we don't have a formalized way to collect that. I think uh, unless Miles and Christy uh, sideswipe me here, I think we're, we're, we're absolutely happy to get that information from yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's used in conjunction with all that other information that's coming in uh, and, and with those standardized assessments. Uh, I, I I think as we move forward and and uh, continue to expand what we're going to call citizen science and and utilizing anglers and others that are on the water that are on the landscape utilizing these resources we might continue to see more opportunities where that data can come in uh perhaps maybe more standardized ways uh and that that information can just continue to to be informed as management tools for for folks like miles and christy as they um as they status the the populations that way so my, my quick recommendation here uh, bill and Jeanine, would be touch base with Miles uh, after the session, whether that's, uh, you know, in the next week or two, maybe chat about the information you've got, uh, how they could utilize that, etc. Uh, and I'd encourage that for, for all folks, if you want to just become more involved, uh, have maybe even more continuing, um, more frequent relationship with the, with the fish bios out of the Slave Lake area there. So. Great, thanks, Kate on. Uh, so we have another question about perch. Um, just wondering, you did a transfer of perch this year, I believe. Do you have plans to expand the stocking of perch? Hi. Uh, so yes, we did do a transfer of perch this year. We actually transferred into two lakes uh, within the Lesser Slave Lake watershed. Uh, the first lake is Mitsu Lake. So this will be the second year of fish transfers to Mitsu Lake. Um, the second lake that we transferred to is Blue Lake. So Blue Lake is just south of High Prairie. It was formerly stocked with rainbow trout. Uh, it hasn't been stocked with rainbow trout in some years now. Um, and we transferred yellow perch in there this year uh, as an opportunity. Currently, those yellow perch are catch and release uh, just until we can tell that they are established. So stay tuned in some of our engagement seminars coming up uh, to understand when those could be available for harvest. Um, right now, um, we those are the only two lakes we're doing in the Lesser Slave Lake watershed, but Kadon will be able to add a little bit more information there. Uh, sure, Christy, thanks. Um... Yeah, the only thing maybe I might add is um, certainly provincially, we're seeing uh, not only walleye stocking, but uh, transfer of other species. Um, and, and, and with that, even expansion of uh, trout stocking opportunities um, as a priority for us over the, over the past two years, over the, over the next few years as well. Uh, that's all to provide more, uh, more fishing opportunities ultimately on the landscape for, for anglers. Um, the only thing, so I, I think in terms of perch stocking, we also, Christy, had some uh, new perch stockings or transfers, I should call them, um, around the Edmonton area and east of Edmonton. Thunder Lake is one that comes to mind. Uh, I think there was a few that were east of, uh, east of Edmonton as well, and we can find that information if folks uh, folks are interested. Um, you know, one thing I might just add on to the perch piece is uh, uh, one thing that folks may or may not know is we don't raise yellow perch in our culture system. 
Uh, we typically do use transfers. Uh, one of the reasons we do that versus other species is perch at least have a very short, uh, I'm going to call it uh, reproductive cycle in the sense that they mature much earlier, uh, live shorter than species such as walleye. And so what, what we can do is uh, typically target yellow perch for uh, for collection a lot easier than we can do with, with other species like walleye. Uh, we've got, uh, we work with the fish culture uh, personnel and, and their infrastructure uh, in order to facilitate those, those collections and transfers into other water bodies. Um, and what we see a lot of times is uh, those perch take just as quick, if not quicker through the, through the transfer versus trying to raise them in, in culture facilities. Uh, lastly, I'll say uh, perch are probably one of the most thoughtful species that we now stock. We've seen a lot of introductions uh, either accidentally or intentionally in water bodies. And, uh, and once they get in, as we see with a lot of our aquatic invasive species programs that Janine does a lot of work with, is once in, they're extremely hard to remove. Uh, easy to add, expensive, hard to take out. And a lot of times uh, they'll compete with other species that are in those water bodies, such as trout or, or other native species. Uh, and that affects ultimately trying to achieve the fisheries management objectives that the public has actually um, you know, supported. So it actually takes a step backwards. So when we talk about fish transfers, uh, it might not look like we're doing a lot for quantity, but a lot of times there's a, there's a really rigorous process that we use in order to try to um, you know, come up with, with good spots where we would want to put perch that's not going to affect other objectives. So thanks, Janine. Thanks, Christy. Great. Thanks, you guys. Uh, so we have a question here from Barry, and Barry is wondering who or what organization has responsibility for managing the lake level? Um, does the weir control the lake level and who controls the weir? Hey, Barry. Uh, so the lake level itself is uh, largely influenced in the, in the Lesser Slave Watershed by precipitation and our contributing water bodies. So we have five major uh, tributaries into Lesser Slave Lake that help to provide uh, some of that lake level and also lake level fluctuation. So if we're not getting rain or we're having a low precip year, um, we do see the lake level change. And most people who have lived in Slave Lake for a little while now uh, kind of see that fluctuation through the year as well. So um, we'll see higher lake levels in the spring, lower lake levels around this time of year. I know that over the last month or so, I've personally noticed that uh, heading down to the lake in town here um, and seeing more beach than I did earlier this year. Um, so the weir itself is a structure that's maintained by Alberta infrastructure. So fisheries doesn't play a role in that. Uh, the weir itself does maintain a lake level uh, in the sense that it backs up flow from that structure while allowing water downstream. So the big thing that we're concerned with is making sure that there's enough water that passes over that structure to maintain those fish populations downstream. Again, fisheries management wasn't involved with the installation or the management of the weir. We have provided recommendations for downstream throw, uh, flow with our wonderful in-stream flow team provincially. I hope that helps. Um, Thanks, Christy. Uh, so our next question here comes from Craig. And Craig is wondering, does winter fishing have more of an impact on the fish population? I, I can provide some insights to that, Janine. Uh, thank you, Craig, for the question. Uh, if we're thinking about rod and reel fishing um, to, on Lesser Slave Lake, I would say no. Uh, the open water season is certainly well more well attended, uh, has higher catch rates, has higher harvest rates. Uh, the winter fishery, by comparison, um, has lower catch rates, has fewer people attending. So of the two, uh, the open water fishery certainly um, has the higher component of what is caught, released, and harvested. Uh, and, and that's fairly consistent with uh, the majority of our water bodies uh, that I would say we manage in the slave area. And, and I, I would wager a guess to say that's fairly consistent uh, provincially. Uh, there can be minor differences in species, like pike is an example, or a more active predator uh, than a walleye is in the winter. So you may see less of a drop in pike catch rates between open uh, water season and cold water season. Um, but overall, we we don't look at uh, the cold water season with rod and reel fishing as um, a, a higher risk than the open water season. Great, thank you, Miles. So we have another question here from Harlan and Harlan is saying there are two healthy fisheries east of Lesser Slave Lake. 
uh, for Calling Lake and Lac La Biche, both of which have a slot size and are doing quite well as I've witnessed. Now I know that uh, Lac La Biche has been stocked heavily in the past as it is part of the reason that it's in a healthy state. Both of these lakes are almost considered trophy walleye lakes. So why hasn't the same regulation been applied to Lesser Slave Lake? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in front of Miles here and uh, give him a breath, Janine. Um, so great question, Harlan. Um, that's really cool feedback. I uh, appreciate that obviously you're getting a chance to uh, get on these different fisheries uh, and clearly seeing some different experiences. And so I, I think the takeaway from tonight and, uh, and from Miles is, um, you know, we talked about earlier that sustainable uh, harvest objective for lesser slave lakes. So managing more for quantity than quality. Um, Hence, uh, you know, knowing that we've got a lot of anglers on Lesser Slave Lake, uh, there's a demand for use and, and for harvest. And so I think as we present the data tonight, uh, it's also an opportunity to reflect on that management objective. Um, you're right, we've had a, a, a harvest slot on Calling Lake for some time. Uh, that certainly uh, has been sustainable, I think, in our view. Over time, the Lesser, or the, the Lac Labiche one was something that was just implemented recently, uh, again, through public participation in, in uh, identifying what that fish management objective should be uh, and, and that being a harvest slot. So, you know, I, I think at this point in time, uh, Miles, Christy and I, you know, there's there's options that are on the table. And I, I think as we present tonight uh, and get a chance to follow up with maybe some options for, you know, review of that, uh, that management objective and the regulations, um, you know, I don't think there's a whole pile that we've taken off the table uh, for Lesser Slave Lake. And that could include um, potential for something like a harvest slot, uh, you know, in the future on that. So uh, I, I I think that's great feedback for tonight and probably reflects, uh, you know, a number of things that people are thinking about. Is that an option? Is status quo an option, et cetera? So. Great. Thanks, Kaden. So just looking at the time here, we've just got time for a couple more questions before we close this evening. Uh, so I have a question here from Tammy and Tammy's wondering the current algae bloom is extensive on the West Basin, as I witnessed on Monday. Could this be an issue for oxygen levels if the lake freezes over before it decomposes? Hey, Tammy. Yeah, so going back to one of our intro questions about algae, uh, one of the things that we see in the algae cycle is that during the day, algae is alive well and creating biologically dissolved oxygen that it puts back into the the lake system as well as the air, the oxygen we breathe, and then at night and particularly in the winter when we get ice over, we see that uh, decomposition is actually pulling oxygen from the system. So um, in cases where we see uh, fish kills under the ice, it's typically as a result of um, some of that oxygen in the system being used in decomposition of some of the plant materials. So there is a possibility that um, algal blooms do have an effect on biologically dissolved oxygen within the lake, um, but it's really difficult to determine what that impact is gonna be. Um, and it's very difficult to predict any kind of fish kill um, with any certainty at all. So what we do is we would typically watch it. It's unfortunate when it happens, um, but we do see this as a common part of the cycle in a number of our highly productive lakes in Alberta. Great, thanks, Christy. I'm gonna combine two questions here to close us off. So first one coming from Tammy, uh, is there an opportunity to do a young of the year study again to see if use of spawning grounds have changed in the lake? And then also another question from Jim here, and Jim is wondering, um, is the spawning population healthy and is it well protected? Uh, yeah, I can um, provide some information there, Janine. So uh, thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and thank you, Tammy, for uh, actually your, your work once upon a time uh, contributing to some of the studies on Lesser Slave Lake uh, and, and the work that you do now uh, in relation to the Watershed Council. Uh, so uh, I'll, I will start with the fish stock. To Jim's question, is the spawning population healthy and well protected? What we're talking about in terms of the regulation regimes and what the desired objectives are is that uh, concept of protection. The regulations right now certainly provide a lot of harvest opportunity. Uh, the 43 centimeter size limit uh, it only protects one to two spawning year classes of fish. So from our previous management regime, it's the least restrictive reg we would have applied. Uh, so there's room for protecting, uh, there, there's room for adding resiliency. 
uh, if we biologically need that to happen. We know we've got some difference in stocks between the East and the West Basin. Uh, and as Kadon had talked about, uh, even with the last conversation there with uh, the application of slots, and this just comes back around to what is that objective. So uh, we know we have a reasonable biomass of fish. We know the East Basin is on track. The West Basin needs a little bit of work. Uh, so the, the what we apply going forward for regs, thinking forward about resiliency, uh, certainly will bring that, that thinking into place. Are we ensuring that there's enough protection there for the long term. We don't want to change regs on slave, uh, you know, like a, a yo-yo very frequently. Um, to Tammy's component to that, thinking about the habitat and where spawning has occurred, uh, is there, I, similar to some of the other questions about different study types, uh, is there opportunity? Uh, sure, there could be. Certainly if we saw some kind of an issue that would say from a management perspective, we need to get a, a better understanding of uh, fish spawning. Um, fortunately, right now, the last three surveys, 2010, 14, and 20, uh, we've seen fairly consistent recruitment. Those year classes vary in their strength, uh, survey to survey, largely due to, as, as Christy's uh, given some great answers, algae, water quality, seasonal variances. Uh, so the nice part is we know consistently babies are coming into this fishery. Um, right now that would say i don't think we need to point a lot of effort into understanding if a change has occurred uh but if we did start to see an issue there or if we started to see um you know higher threats i think to those spawning habitats within the lake but also understanding the value of a lot of the river systems the swan the drift pile the south heart that feed the lake and their utility in the spawning um part of the life cycle that that might trigger that need uh so I wouldn't say we need it right now, but it, it's in our deck to say, if we see this threat, those are the things that we would look to investigate. Great, thanks so much, Miles. Um, so just looking at our time here, we're just over 8.30, so we are going to call our session to a close. However, there is a really great question here from Brett that just came in. Um, and Brett is saying, if there were ever going to be changes to the regulations, what is the timeline for that decision to be made? So we'll we'll close that one off as, as our last question for the evening here, because it closes, sure. closes the uh, evening perfectly. <laughs> what a great one, Janine. And uh, you know, if I don't get a chance to say it, thanks everyone for, for joining tonight and taking time out of your evening. Um, so I think it's a great question. Uh, we had a chance to provide some um, some communications on what's happening with Lesser Slave Lake tonight. Uh, I know that's in response to, uh, we have some pretty condensed uh, timelines uh, within our regulation cycle that uh, Miles you know, had a little bit to say on earlier. And really what we wanted to get out in front of, of for folks today is this, this is a, a large fishery, a large multi-use fishery. It's our, it's our largest fishery that we manage in Alberta. And so, you know, tonight was an opportunity to disseminate some information out, uh, talk about some of the challenges in front of us, um, folks to take that away. And I think what we're going to be looking at is taking some of the input we had tonight from folks, Janine. Um, and then also we're going to get probably input outside of tonight, uh, I, I suspect as well for folks that couldn't attend. Um, and then that's going to inform, I think, or form what we want to bring forward as potential regulation options and, and regulations options within maybe um, options for our fisheries management objective uh, for the recreational fishery uh, on Lesser Slave Lake. So I think our timeline typically would be on that, on that Janine, is we'll take this away today, uh, look at some of the options that folks presented to us. Uh, and then I think typically what we would do is within January, that's typically when we do our provincial regulation engagement. Um, so folks would be able to look forward to that uh, probably after the Christmas break. Uh, that also involves different forms of providing input into those, uh, either for either via online surveys, uh, and of course, uh, if in doubt, uh, you know, contact Miles, Christy, myself, etc., uh, with any of your input on on those pieces. So, um, could there be a regulation change for Lesser Slave Lake beginning April first? Um, that's possible. Uh, I don't think it's prescribed at this point. Uh, and, and I think uh, Miles and Christy and I would all state we're not here to rush anything. Uh, I think we've given ourselves some options here, uh, some timelines to consider those options and apply those options. Um, but but certainly, I, th I think as Miles identified, um, if we want to have options going forward, we probably need to have some action. Great. Thanks, Kate on. So just to bring us home here uh, in terms of next steps, so I think that was a really great summary and thanks Brett for that question. So um, of course the purpose of tonight was really to, to start that dialogue and have that conversation um, and open up the door uh, for you to contact our fisheries biologists from the 
the area there. And so to stay in touch with us, we are very active on Facebook on our Buy Wild Alberta account. If you happen to have a Facebook account, that's a great place to follow us to stay up to date on the work that we're doing. We post lots of great pictures and sort of behind the scenes looks into turn into what our teams are up to. So um, if you're not on Facebook, of course, we have lots of information that Miles mentioned uh, through the presentation on both alberta.ca and My Wild Alberta. So Google is your best friend. Um, we would also like to hear your feedback on how the session went tonight. So um, when you close the webinar, a survey will pop up automatically and we'd love for you to uh, fill that out for us so that we can hear more um, as we are planning more sessions like this in the future. So um, if you're interested, we have a session coming up for the Upper Pembina River on October 28th and a session for the Bow River on November 3rd. So a couple of different water bodies, maybe not potentially in the area. Um, but we really want to thank you for spending your evening with us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and all of your great questions that you put forward. Um, if you still have outstanding questions that you'd like to hear, um, again, this is an open invite for you to contact Miles um, and get in touch with him or Christy and, and ask your questions and, and um, share information with them and so on. So um, just a heads up, I think Miles is going to be away from the office next week. Um, so if you don't hear back from him next week, you'll hear back from him shortly after that. So with that, folks, we'd just like to say thank you again very much for spending your evening with us, and we look forward to connecting with you soon. So have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.